On this week's 51%, we tour an art exhibition exploring our relationships with fertility and the physical and emotional tolls of inequities in reproductive health care. These issues have been around for such a long time. The fact that it's still around and it's still on people's minds is really reckoned with in this exhibition. We also check out a new statue recognizing Sojourner Truth and her escape from slavery in the 19th century. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on, I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King. We've got a trio of stories and interviews centered around the arts for you today, starting with a new statue that is drawing crowds in Ulster County, New York. For the next 10 months, the likeness of Sojourner Truth will be on view at Kingston City Hall. The bronze sculpture by artist Trina Green, called Sojourner Truth, First Step to Freedom, depicts Truth as she escaped slavery in 1826 while carrying her infant daughter, Sophia. The statue recently received a warm welcome in Kingston, with a reception featuring performances by the Women's Drum Song Orchestra and actor Aisha Kendrick portraying Truth in a specially created monologue. I did not know the many steps that I would take to find this word freedom. All of those steps that I did not know I would take pushed me forward. Sojourner Truth was a prominent abolitionist, preacher, and activist around the time of the Civil War and fought for the civil rights of both black Americans and women. Her speeches, including her famous Ain't I a Woman address, were heard across the country, but her early life was spent in Ulster County. Former Ulster County historian Ann Gordon says Truth was born into slavery as Isabella Bomfrey near Esopus at the turn of the 19th century. Truth was enslaved for almost 30 years and sold multiple times to farmers and estate owners she would later describe as cruel and harsh. A lot of people say, oh, well, this was northern slavery. It's not such a big deal. Well, what did it have in common with southern slavery? Children were taken from their families and sold. Wives and husbands were sold apart. People were punished in the most brutal fashion. And you can see in the notices in the papers for runaways, um, scars, burns, missing ear, brand on cheek. This was northern slavery, and it was a big deal. Slavery in New York was officially abolished in 1827, but two years before that, Truth's enslaver at the time, a man named John DeMont, made her an offer. If she worked really hard, he would let her go one year early in 1826. Gordon says Truth did just that, despite suffering a hand injury and giving birth to Sophia. But when it came time to hold up his end of the bargain, Gordon says DeMont used these things to claim Truth wasn't as productive as she could have been, and he denied her her freedom. She knew she deserved to be treated fairly. And after thinking about it, remembering her mother saying it's a sin to run away at night from your master, she decided she wouldn't run, she would walk. She wouldn't go at night. She would go at that part of the night just before dawn. One October morning, and we know exactly when it was, she took her infant and left behind her other children, two daughters and a son, and walked away. Gordon says a local family took Truth in as a free woman and paid DeMont for the year of services he felt he was owed. Sophia, however, was temporarily returned to DeMont because even though slavery was quote-unquote abolished, Gordon says the children of enslaved mothers were still expected to work for their mother's enslavers until their mid to late 20s. Truth would later win the freedom of one of her sons, In 1828, she learned that her son Peter, who was then five years old, had been illegally sold into slavery out of state to an owner in Alabama. She filed a lawsuit that would make its way through the New York State Supreme Court and won, making her the first black woman to sue a white man and win. Truth's court documents were also on display at the reception for one night only. New York State archivist Brian Keogh says the documents were feared lost until they were stumbled upon in a state archives folder in 2022. And it's 
so powerful to be near these documents, right, and see where Isabella, who was mentioned, could not read or write. She signed her, the habeas corpus petition with an X, right? But to be able to do that, to have the courage to challenge power in this country, it's not African-American history. It's American history. The remainder of Truth's life was dedicated to activism. She would help the Union Army recruit black soldiers during the Civil War and help the newly freed find jobs and restart their lives in the years after. She advocated for women's rights and lobbied against segregation. And after a life dedicated to freedom and faith, Truth died at her home in Battle Creek, Michigan in 1883. Kingston Mayor Steve Noble says the city plans to feature the statue in group tours and other programs over the course of the next year to help city residents connect to their local history. To start off, the city is seeking work from local artists to exhibit alongside the statue. We're going to be having a new exhibition that we're calling Freedom uh, in our first floor art gallery, which is on the ground floor of City Hall. And it just will uh, be such a great combination of having this beautiful statue, but then also be able to have a whole variety of other artists be able to show uh, to the community what freedom means to them. We are the women. We are Sojourner Truth, first step to freedom is on view at Kingston City Hall Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. until August 2025. After that, it will make stops at Ulster County offices and the Newburgh Free Library before being permanently installed at SUNY New Paltz. Across the Hudson River in Poughkeepsie, Vassar College's Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center is hosting a traveling exhibit exploring the many joys and challenges of the female body, of being a person with a uterus. Called Reproductive Health, Fertility, Agency, the exhibit launched at the Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College Chicago in 2021. And now, more than two years after the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade, it's being looked at in a whole new light. I recently stopped by the Loeb's version of the exhibit for a tour with Deputy Director Mary Kay Lambino. Originally, there were eight artists in the Chicago version of the show, and there are ten here because we added two artists that are in our collection. And all of the artists are really exploring issues dealing with the female body and the injustices around fertility and reproductive health, and they're doing it in a very personal way. So they're often telling stories from their own lives or people that they know, and exploring the ways in which those personal experiences are really universal, right? And while these topics are considered political sometimes, they really do affect people's lives, and that's what I love about the exhibition, because you're able to understand the ways in which lives are affected and because the artists are so expressive in their different media they're able to bring those stories alive in in various ways yeah so let's talk a little bit about i guess some of the mediums that are used in this exhibit too because i know this is coming from like a photography uh, museum right but there's a bunch of different types of art that are being used in this yes exactly and i will say the first thing that you see when you walk into the galleries is a big flag that hangs from the ceiling and it's a three-dimensional piece that you can walk all the way around and it's really a sculpture it's not photography based and that piece is by an artist who goes by king cobra also known as doreen garner and the piece is called betsy's flag and it's made of silicon but it really looks like it resembles the flesh of a black woman and it's in the shape of a flag actually the flag um, that we know from colonial times. Um, However, instead of having 13 stars, it has 16. And those are in reference to patients of J. Marion Sims, a doctor from the 19th century who used enslaved women um, to experiment on. And it's a harrowing story that really affected the artist. And she brings that story to light and really explores the historical injustices that have happened, you know, continue to happen actually even today. 
I can see it from where we're standing here. And it definitely, it's, it's a very striking entrance, I feel like, to the, to the exhibit. It just sort of kind of hits you as soon as you walk in. So. Yes, and the other side, because you're able to circumvent the piece, is completely different, and it's embedded with jewels and beads, and it shimmers, but it also has, it resembles what is beneath the flesh. So mm -hmm. it has more of a kind of visceral feel to it. Um, well, would you like to, I guess, walk through a little bit? Yes, that'd be great. Okay. So this piece is by Joanne Leonard, and it's called From Journal of a Miscarriage, and it's from 1973. And what we're seeing here is a set of collages that were all part of her journal that she began when she was pregnant. And the first entry was this really joyful image, which we also used on our banner, and it's kind of the poster for a lot of the exhibition's promotions because it is really joyous, and it's an image of a pear with legs, and um, the person looks like they're getting ready to do a cartwheel, or the pear is going to cartwheel, and below it, it says pregnant. So when she first found out she was pregnant, she started this journal, and it's a visual journal. It's not written because she's an artist, and then shortly after that, she had a miscarriage and lost the baby, and then she continued to use this journal actually as a form of healing and a way of her um, dealing with her grief. And it was quite a private um, practice for her to work through a lot of the feelings that she had. But what's interesting about this exhibition kind of has a sub-theme of private versus public mm -hmm. and how people um, deal with some of the inequities that they're experiencing. And miscarriage is a topic that people don't like to talk about. It's often hidden. It's something that so many people experience, yet it's considered taboo to talk about it. And even when she first showed this piece back in the 1970s, it was sequestered in a room, kind of like behind a curtain or a door, so that it was hidden. And I'm so pleased that now we're able to show it out in the open because of course miscarriage is something that happens so frequently and it's something that um, we'd love to have more discussion about. I can see sort of like just how the, like the progression of, of pictures here, these are all part of the same piece. Yeah, um, so I don't know if she did one every day, but there are mm -hmm. 30 collages total for oh, wow. the month that she was first experiencing this grief. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the images are funny, they're cut paper and drawing and they incorporate a lot of the pain and suffering, but also some of the release of emotions that can happen when you're working through, you know, different emotions that come up. Mm -hmm. This one looks like in an abortion kit. Is that kind of what I'm looking at? Or I guess like an obstetrics kit? Yes. So Laya Abril is an artist who, her work occupies almost the entire second room of the exhibition and it's full of images and text. There's a lot to absorb here and a lot of them are personal stories, but some of them really speak to when there is no access to abortion, what women have had to resort to, right? So you'll see tools of obstetrics and gynecology, um, but also things like coat hangers and knitting needles and some instructions even on how people had administered abortions in their homes when it, they didn't have access to good health care because of the illegalities, depending on where the woman lived at the time. So these that we're looking at here, this illegal instrument kit, for instance, it looks almost like a medical illustration in terms of its style. And there's even these little tags hanging off of some of the materials and some of the tools. Um, so it feels like it's a very official document almost, um, but of course these things were and are considered illegal. Um, so one would have to be breaking the law in order to administer a self-abortion. Um, you mentioned earlier that you know this, these are such heavy topics. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you guys are doing to kind of like foster maybe more communication around it in a way of just like also like taking care of yourself? Absolutely, and certainly taking care of visitors. Uh, we realize that this is intense material and might even trigger some emotions 
through our own experiences as we see the exhibition. There are a few things we've implemented that we hope to continue even after this show has moved on and we have another show here. Um, for instance, we have a reflection room. The last gallery is a chance for people to sit down on comfortable furniture and read some of the materials that we have there, reflect on their experience, and we even have reflection cards where visitors can make comments on what they've seen, on how they feel, and then those are posted on the wall so that when the next visitors come in, they can experience what other people have offered. Mm -hmm. So there begins to be more of a communal feeling of coming to an exhibition like this. Um, I think an important message is that we're not alone in this, right? There's many people who experience trauma through um, inequities and lack of good health care and access to reproductive health care. The other things that we've done through working with an advisory committee is offer the viewers more choice in the way that they experience the show. Mm. We've produced a small zine um, which has a very different feel. It's not a kind of art historical document that we often use as our for our brochures or exhibition catalogs. Mm. It's more a place where people can go to find out what words mean. There's a glossary, for instance, also to kind of give them guidance on how they might be able to process all of the information on the exhibition. And there's also resources there. So on a QR code, people can find a whole list of resources if they're in need of care. This is different than the original exhibit that was out in Chicago. But of course, now this is after the fall of Roe v. Wade. So there's some just sort of natural differences in the way that we're gonna be looking at some of this work. But also, you've brought in some local artists and added to the exhibit as well. Tell me a little bit about the additional works that have been brought in. Yeah, thank you for asking about the difference of showing this exhibition now as opposed to 2021. One thing to mention is that that was during the pandemic and they didn't have as big of an audience as they hoped. Mm -hmm. And also, as you noted, the world has changed since then and Roe has overturned and access to health care for reproductive and reproductive rights have certainly shifted, even in this country. Um, we're in New York State, so we still have access, but there are many people in this country who don't. Um, and in terms of adding the artists, we chose two artists that were already in our collection. One of them is this artist, Jess Dugan. And Jess did a double portrait of themselves and their partner right after they had their baby, Eleanor. And we can see them both holding the baby very tenderly as a family portrait. And originally, the portrait was just going to be of Jess's partner, who'd given birth to their baby, Eleanor. And then there was a notion that they're a complete family, and each of them is parenting in their own way. So they decided to turn the camera on themselves and also take a self-portrait. So then this becomes a diptych with each of the parents holding the baby. And it's really impactful, I think, because it shows the intensity of that moment right after childbirth and the closeness and the bonding that happens that early in someone's life. And I like that too because it gives them both the opportunity to have a, a, a portrait of them holding their, their their child as well as opposed to maybe like a group photo where someone's holding it and someone's standing next. Like, you know, it's like, it gets across the point that they're both having their own parenting experience here. Yeah, so. and it's also very real. Um, it's not one of those things you might see on social media mm -hmm. where right before that first portrait with the new child, both of the parents are spiffed up and cleaned up and they look wonderfully perfect, even though they've just gone through what can be a very um, difficult and long experience of giving birth. Um, and here we see Jess's partner still in the hospital issued underwear that they give people right after they've given birth. And you can see they're both quite exhausted and they have bags under their eyes. And it's a much more real portrait than I think we're used to seeing um, that focuses on maybe a more accurate portrait of that early moment in someone's life. I agree, I, th I really like that part of it too. I'd love to talk about this artist if we have time and yeah. if it makes it in, that would be great too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as sort of a bookend to the exhibition, we decided to put the work of Eleanor Carucci in this last room, which is also our reflection space. Mm -hmm. And Eleanor Carucci is a photographer who really focuses on different stages of a woman's life. The artist who herself is in middle age is really embracing the period of her own life that happens after fertility. So you'll see images where she's using menstrual blood as she experiences her last period. And then another image, a really striking image, is of her uterus after she had a hysterectomy. Wow. Um, something that I had never seen before, mm -hmm. and it is quite striking. And another image of her and her husband um, in a very intimate moment, even after she experiences menopause, it doesn't mean that sexuality and passion and that part of life has passed on um, with her fertility. And so it's another area where you don't really see a lot of material out there in the open. It's a silent topic that only certain people talk about. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to feature Eleanor's work. Um, well, thank you so much for showing me around. Um, you know, finally, is there are there any, like, I guess, takeaways or anything that you hope visitors get from this exhibit? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we've really recognized in doing this exhibition is that these issues have been around for such a long time, right? Issues of reproductive injustice and difficulty accessing proper care and inequities that women have faced in the medical field for centuries. Mm -hmm. and. The fact that it's still around and it's still an issue and it's still on people's minds um, is really reckoned with in this exhibition. And I think it's important. I think it's almost an urgent topic that we need to be talking about. And these artists have done that in such a poetic and personal way. And I think it's a great way to share this information out to a wider public. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Mary Kay Lambino is the deputy director of the Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center at Vassar College, which is hosting the Columbia College Chicago traveling exhibit, Reproductive Health, Fertility, Agency, through February 2nd. You can find links to more information at our website, wamcpodcasts.org. Finally, a women's art collective, an independent book publisher in New York's Hudson Valley, is celebrating its 50th birthday this year. Since 1974, the Women's Studio Workshop in Rosendale has been a space for women to create. Hi, are you Jessie? Yes, I am. Hi, Hi I'm Natalie. It's nice to meet you. Come nice in. to meet you, too. Thank you. Deputy Director Natalie Ranganeski says the workshop's four founders, artist Anne Kalmbach, Tatana Kellner, Barbara Leoff Burge, and Anita Wetzel, started it as a teaching collective for an art scene that didn't have many educational opportunities for women. They found that they were being met with a lot of sexism, a lot of exclusion, and so they wanted to create a space where women's artwork would be elevated and permanently recorded in history. Now the workshop boasts studios for printing, papermaking, ceramics, and more. Ranganeski says the workshop has served more than 5,000 artists and expanded its scope to include trans, non-binary, intersex, and gender-fluid artists as well. It has published more than 240 books over the years, some of which have found homes in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Tate Modern, and the Library of Congress. Its latest exhibition, called A Radical Alteration, showcases some of the organization's favorite titles. As Ranganeski points out, many of the books are works of art themselves, designed more for museums than for your home library. As we make our way through the gallery, she motions to a red film strip and cassette tape that, to me, looks like any other film strip and cassette tape, but it's actually made entirely out of paper. She says Carnegie Mellon professor Iman Ye went to painstaking lengths to recreate it. She discovered this educational film strip in a closet, and she became totally fascinated by the idea that there was this fully defunct educational object teaching people about a medium 
print that many would argue is also becoming defunct. <laughs> By recreating this object, she ensured that it was actually going to get recollected into all of these libraries and institutions, the kind that would have put this educational film strip into a closet. Another book by Cherokee artist Rhiannon Skye Tafoya uses traditional basket weaving practices to form its pages. Ranganeski says Tafoya lived at the workshop as an artist in residence in 2019. The final product folds together to look like a basket and includes a collection of poems dedicated to Tafoya's grandmother. One really exciting thing is that we were able to acquire a set of Cherokee syllabary letterpress so that Skye was actually able to do letterpress in her grandmother's spoken language, which was really beautiful. So this is the, this will be the text block, and it's actually two books. Oh, wow. And the I'm workshop offers multiple it. residencies a year to artists uh, of varying experience. One current resident is Ruth Carlin, a photographer and retired teacher from Chicago who is printing a new photo book she calls Carlin in Bed. The title is a tongue-in-cheek reference to the book artist Richard Minsky and his 1988 work Minsky in Bed. But while Minsky in Bed depicts intimate details of the artist's sexual conquests, Carlin in Bed is more literal. At 90 years old, Carlin has trouble getting around and spends a lot of time in bed with her legs elevated to address swelling. It's boring. There's not a lot you can do when, with your legs up in the air. I mean, here I am with my iPhone, my legs up in the air, and I took a picture, and it seemed like a good idea, and, you know, I did several of them. The result then, is an accordion-style uh, book with several photos of Carlin's legs, uh, sometimes at night, sometimes with a book in her lap, and always with a short caption handwritten by Carlin herself. My constant companion is my iPad. I need a dog or a cat. <laughs> so that, that kind Carlin of says her goal is not to poke fun at Minsky per se, but to provide a glimpse at what it's like to be a woman of a certain age, specifically 90. For the past week, she's been finalizing designs, printing out pages, and signing copies of her book, which the workshop will bind over the next few weeks. It's not a mass production. They're aiming for about 50 copies total. But Carlin says the whole experience has helped her feel seen, kind of like when she first bought her favorite red glasses. When a woman is over 50 or 60, she becomes invisible. And I had gone from being uh, harassed, getting attention for my looks or being harassed for my looks, and then becoming totally invisible for years. And in a way, it was a relief. I mean, there's, there are limits to this nonsense. But then I bought these glasses, and I get stopped on the street. People stop me and say, I love your glasses. And it's incredible. I mean, I'm no longer invisible, even though I'm a very old lady. And it, it, um, it's quite amazing to me. Women's Studio Workshop will formally celebrate its 50th anniversary with a gala on November 16th. A radical alteration, Women's Studio Workshop as a sustainable model for art making is now on view at the studio through the end of the year. In 2025, it will make stops at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts and the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. Thanks for listening to this week's 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio based in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Madeline Reynolds, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at our website, wamcpodcasts.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can stay in the loop on all of WAMC shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at wamc.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl. I was nobody else. I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half. He was a hollow laugh And I lost my cool somewhere along the way A nightmare down the hallway I had to learn how to look away I lost my cool